This is Pen Dust Radio. Welcome, all you literati, you lovers of words and tales, you who need a break in your hurried, harried lives. We have a salve for your soul with stories imaginative and original. Short stories, riveting fiction, and wildly creative nonfiction. Pen Dust Radio. Definitely not the same old story. Please visit us at pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. We publish literary fiction and creative nonfiction. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. I'm Anne Marino, author of Hawksmoor, a novel of vampire and fairy. Hawksmoor is a paranormal mystery in which a vampire, Robin Dashwood, has been hiding from his past, and really himself, in New York. He's poured himself into his work as a history professor at New York University. Since his painful transition into vampire, he has avoided the place of his 18th century human birth, Hawksmoor Castle in Yorkshire, England. A twist of fate brings Robin to a Manhattan exhibition of Hawksmoor Castle's most valuable treasures. While combating waves of bittersweet nostalgia, he meets Lady Caroline de Berry, whose family now resides at Hawksmoor. Robin learns that someone from his human past suffered a brutal death at the castle. He decides to return to Hawksmoor to uncover what he suspects was an 18th century murder, and to pursue Lady Caroline, who has captured his heart. I hope you enjoy listening to the first two chapters of Hawksmoor. Stay tuned after the excerpt for a short interview with me. Chapter One Sunlight sparkled off a thousand different New York windows as Robin Dashwood sat out on his terrace, pretending to sip a morning cup of coffee. There were just so many pointless misconceptions about vampires and the forever nocturnal bit had to be one of the silliest. He'd been a vampire for more than three hundred years, and he still found his morning coffee a high point in his waking hours. Of course, the ritual of breathing in the rich fumes of the brew and remembering what it was like to actually enjoy drinking the stuff had changed dramatically over two centuries. It had been coffee in spectacular bone china served on heavy silver once. Now he grabbed a cup in his own kitchen before heading off to teach his classes at nearby NYU. Unlike other vampires who truly hated this new egalitarian era, with its self-service mandate and constant industrial noise, Robin quite liked the 21st century. He could lose himself in the self-absorbed hubbub. He seldom yearned for the grace and grandeur of earlier times any more. Morning, Professor, came the voice of his current girlfriend, Kate Ashby. She was a young actress, exceptionally pretty in a waifish sort of way, and even moderately successful with a role on a television soap opera. They had a comfortable relationship that neither of them had ever expected to last as long as it already had. But then he had a weakness for the stalwart denizens of the theatre. What others might see as shallow narcissism, Robin saw as a valiant belief in themselves and their talent, despite moments of utter rejection. He found their dedication to the work and giddy belief in a better future completely disarming. The company of artists had always given him a brief sensation of being human, and in keeping with the restless spirit of actors, Robin had begun to sense Kate's growing boredom with her former history teacher and her increased interest in Hollywood. Robin glanced up from his newspaper. Don't call me, Professor. It makes me feel so old. His voice was soft but rather hoarse around the edges, still imbued with the upper-class English accent that betrayed the country of his human birth. You're not so old, she came across the balcony to plunk her own mug of coffee down on the wrought iron table. More than three hundred years old, actually, he smiled again as Kate dropped a kiss on his forehead. She was a thin, gangly thing, he thought affectionately 
all legs, elbows, and long blonde hair. It was an effect exaggerated by a plaid miniskirt and black leggings that disappeared into thick, hobnail boots favored by college students. He had a moment to remember how breathtaking women once were in their mysterious confections of velvet and silks, their dainty feet shod in whimsical satin slippers. Robin breathed in one of the last draughts of the rapidly cooling coffee. Women had seemed to float in clouds of quietly rustling layers of taffeta. Robin, broke in Kate impatiently, you heard what I said, right? He shook his head to drive away the memories. I'm sorry, love. What about tonight? Kate made a sour face. You're such a space case. The opening night reception at the Glockner Gallery, remember? I promised my PR lady I'd go. Some boring historical thing. You'll probably love it. I left the invitation on the kitchen counter. Robin frowned. Why would a PR firm want its soap opera actresses? At boring historical things. English people with titles will be there. Good social media opportunity. Kate swallowed a long drink of her coffee. Gotta run, Robin. I've got an audition for that new Taylor Mac thing. Good luck, then. Won't get it. I'm too mainstream pretty, she replied matter-of-factly as she rose from her chair. Put this in your head. Glockner Gallery, eight o'clock tonight. I believe I have it now. Thank you. He returned his attention to the Russian situation in the paper. It's black tie, Robin, and I know you have a faculty meeting. Robin let out a short breath to cool his rising temper. I will be at the Glockner at eight o'clock tonight, gorgeously attired in my finest dinner suit, and you, my love, can stop worrying about it. Okay, I trust you. Kate bent over and slid her arms down around his neck. She kissed his cheek. It's just that you disappear sometimes, and I can never find you. In my secret life, he said with a small yawn, I kill people. Kate giggled. Yeah, right. Robin put the boring historical thing out of his mind until he returned from rather a long day at the university. Martini time, young Professor Dashwood, announced his neighbor, Arthur Silver, a spry eight-year-old who had once swallowed fire and swords in the Borsch Belt era. If only that were true, Robin said as he unlocked his mailbox in the foyer and retrieved its meager contents. What's up, Arthur? Arthur put on his ringmaster's voice. Tonight in the Bailey's Lounge, Daisy Meadows and the Fawcett Triplets will be performing Torch Song Classics of the Thirties. He lost the artificial tone. You coming, Robin? Dashwood shook his head regretfully. As much as I would prefer listening to Daisy and the Fawcett sisters, I have to squire Kate around a cocktail party. Well, if Daisy doesn't have her dentures refitted, they'll be doing a Sunday matinee. I wouldn't dream of missing that one. He currently lived a dull life for a vampire, Robin mused as he rode the old cage elevator up to the fifth floor. But its unremarkable qualities were what made it a private art piece. It would have been easy to be like the handful of other vampires he had met over the last three hundred years, living out lives of world-weary jet-setters. He, too, could be using his accumulated wealth to languish about trendy watering holes, drinking the chic dry, and secretly pining for yesteryear when no one complained much, when the odd serving wench or two went missing. Instead, he owned a colorful old five-story building in Greenwich Village called the Bailey. The still elegant Bailey had always housed the theater trade, from days of Victorian music hall to vaudeville and Broadway. It remained a haven for retired stage personalities and a few young hopefuls. None of the Bailey's theater folk knew Robin Dashwood for their landlord, and he never revealed how he'd caught most of their acts in their heydays. He loved the theater and its people, surrounding himself with their peculiar brand of vibrance, humor, and survival instincts, kept him in touch with his human past. Since buying the Bailey in 1908, he had found it a fascinating way of measuring the passage of time. Robin shoved open the elevator cage door with his elbow as he struggled to hang on to an unwieldy stack of student essays.
He cried last week when Mabel Fearsome had finally succumbed to the cancer in her lungs. She had been a beautiful creature in her time. Mabel the Ethereal was how they billed her in those days. He remembered her Isadora style of Greek dancing well. Of course, Isadora hadn't finished her performances by shedding her scarves one by one. But then Isadora had never been the toast of the state fair circuit, either. Mabel had enchanted wide-eyed farm boys throughout the country and had broadened the appreciation of the dance considerably during her long career. Robin unlocked his flat and unceremoniously dumped his students' midterm papers on the foyer table. He had little more than an hour to change clothes and dash over to the Art Institute. Besides his history classes at NYU and his relationship with Kate, there wasn't much else. He still saw little theater and worked on his fourth scholarly book for his editor at Mercury Press. Of course, about once a week, he had to feed. Most vampires fed more often for the sheer hedonism of it. But in true aesthetic spirit, Robin had learned to quell the powerful urge to steal human blood for nearly seven days. He was literally starving by then, so he usually killed rather than deploying the more refined small drink so favored by really skillful vampires. He hunted among drug addicts, vagrants, panhandlers, pimps, and hardcore criminals, a particular favorite being drug dealers who could be counted on to be fairly clear of narcotics themselves and well-nourished in comparison to their clientele. It was fortunate, in a way, that he was so hungry when he found one of his victims. It was the only way he could stomach the sour taste of their badly depleted blood. Robin bent to pick up a note that had fallen from one of the student papers. It was a love-struck message from Maria, one of his eleven o'clock lecture attendees. She'd developed a major crush and had just started to send him little notes full of promises to do wonderful things for and to him. It was far from the first time a student had fallen into such a trap. Vampires were magnetic creatures. It was helpful in gaining quick confidences that led to feeding. And like most vampires, Robin Dashwood was beyond beautiful. He tried to hide his tall, imperially slender frame in baggy suits and his large, luminous green eyes behind round, bookish, tortoiseshell spectacles with fake lenses. He wore his gleaming chestnut-colored hair quite long in a severe blunt cut that nearly brushed his thin shoulders, hoping that it would conceal his features. It only enhanced the flawless planes of his angular face and the cool pale of his skin. Robin hated to waste the evening on a cocktail party. He was in the mood to sit at his desk and work on his biography of William Pitt. He loved the relative quiet of the flat, when Kate wasn't home running over her deplorable dialogue for the next day's shoot, or watching moronic comedies on television, or talking too loudly to her soap opera comrades on the phone. It really was time to send her off to Hollywood and into the arms of some deserving young man out there. Kate wouldn't even mind very much. She was sufficiently armored with a titanium self-regard that his vampire magnetism, a survival tool designed for making quick connections with prey, failed to make much of a dent once Kate had gotten used to him. In fact, it was what had held them together so long. Passionately in love with herself and her career, Kate remained oblivious to his occasionally odd schedule, never noticing with any genuine clarity that he never really ate or ever made any headway with a glass of wine. She provided him with plausible cover, enabling him to gracefully step around possible entanglements with other women and to exist with minimal complication. A dark voice in his head told him he had another very tempting option for ridding himself of Kate Ashby. He pushed the idea away with a shudder. It must be nearly time to go in search of a target. Tonight, after Kate was asleep, he'd find somebody. Robin emerged from the Bailey, impeccably turned out in his favorite dinner suit. Made for him in the 1930s, it possessed superb lines, almost extinct in modern versions. It was a perfect spring evening, 
he had little trouble flagging down a taxi. Perhaps going out wasn't such a bad idea after all. The Glockner Gallery, please, said Robin as he slid into the back seat. The driver nodded jovially. Opening night party, right? I'm old school. Remember when cabbies used to know what was happening anywhere in the city? Not these days with Uber and Lyft. Would you happen to know what the opening is for? I honestly don't know myself. Robin reached into his breast pocket for the invitation as the cab pulled away from the curb. It would probably say something about the event. He hoped it wasn't another retrospective on the impact of a fashion magazine. Some English display of old furniture. The cabbie thought for a second. From some castle. Hawk something castle. Robin froze. Surely it heard the man incorrectly. Hawksmoor Castle, he asked in a low voice. The driver beamed. Yeah, that's it, Hawksmoor Castle. Couldn't forget that name. With trembling hands, Robin tore open the cream-colored envelope and read the engraved card inside. Lady Caroline de Berry would be present to open the exhibit of fine English antiques from Hawksmoor, all to benefit current repairs at the castle itself in northern England. He let out a small, strangled cry. The cabbie looked back in the rearview mirror in real concern. You okay? Hawksmoor Castle. The words swam in front of his face. Hawksmoor Castle. His keep. His abandoned responsibility. His earldom. The place where he should be buried next to the woman who should have been his countess. Who would have had his sons. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Her name still had the power to hurt him like a blow to the body. You want I should pull over? The cabbie began slowing the yellow cab down a fraction. Hey, mister! The hunger began to pound in his temples like a migraine. His joints ached with it. His horror at the sudden reemergence of Hawksmoor Castle, the place of his birth, had caused the blood hunger to accelerate. This was a disaster. His head reeled at the possible ruination of the careful, predictable life he had so pointedly devised for himself. He had always been meticulous, hunting in the smallest hours of the night in shadowy corners of New York where even angels dare not alight. But now, in the middle of bustling Soho, he was a vampire rising. Hey, mister, repeated the worried cab driver. What should I do? Robin felt his eyes dilate, a targeting system booting up. His unique revenant chemistry was reconfiguring for attack. He inhaled desperately, trying to reroute the impulses to what was left of his humanity. The relentless migraine narrowed, focused, and became a laser, a razor blade ripping through his veins. Yes, Robin hissed. Pull over. I'll, I'll radio for an ambulance, the driver offered as he edged the vehicle off the main thoroughfare and onto a quiet side street where he double parked. Hang on, buddy. Robin was in a deadlock. Frantic attempts to defuse his vampire system were failing, lost in the hypersonic pulse in his veins, igniting every nerve ending. He felt his entire frame light up like a Roman candle. The pain was exhilarating. Robin Dashwood was offline. What remained was a devastating weapon. Come help me. Sure thing, mister. The cabbie jumped out and came around to the back door. He held out a strong hand for Robin to grasp. I'm sorry, the vampire said hoarsely as he accepted the hand. It was the last flickering remnant of Robin Dashwood. What the... the cabbie began. His superior vampire strength had the cab driver in the back seat and neatly pinned with a crushed larynx before the man could finish his sentence. Chapter 2 Kate would be furious. He was over an hour late. It had taken some time to repair the damage after he dumped the unfortunate cabbie in a convenient alleyway. The crisp white shirt had been drenched with blood so he had made a stop at Barney's to fetch a suitable replacement, a mind-boggling feat made considerably easier by one of his vampire traits. 
Much like humans, different vampires possess different attributes and talents. These could include mental telepathy, simple matter transformations, aerial abilities, tracking specific victims by molecule, and short or long distance teleportation. Robin knew there were vampires of enormous personal powers throughout the world, although he was not one of them. Those creatures not only came equipped with great natural abilities, but also cultivated others with meticulous care. Robin had no desire to become a vampire king. He was content to quietly avoid human detection and survive. After the kill, Robin had become a shade. It was the most important skill in his almost non-existent arsenal. He literally could will himself to evaporate and become one with the shadows. Humans could not see him, although animals and some true psychics could sense him. In such a state, Robin could move swiftly and silently through human environments. This time, his shade had joined the shoppers in the busy aisles of Barney's, selecting a clean shirt and making good his escape. It had taken him some time to summon enough courage to walk up to the guarded entrance to the Glockner Gallery. He was desperately afraid of what he would find there, a few of his former possessions, perhaps, the chance to touch one or two, scanning for any trace left lingering of his father, maybe even her, maybe even Elizabeth, and the truth of what happened to them all the truth he had avoided learning for three hundred years. It hadn't been difficult to hide from the impact his disappearance had made to the people he loved. No historians particularly cared what happened that summer's night so long ago in a remote northern earldom. Nobody cared any more what happened to his family and to his betrothed. He could pretend whatever he liked about them all, devise pleasant stories about how they all went on with their lives without him. But now the reality might suddenly jump out at him from any corner of the exhibition. Robin was both exhilarated and anxious as he passed through the invitation-only checkpoint. The essence of the cab driver had strengthened him. He was forced to admit that higher-quality blood really did improve his physical state. But a wave of homesickness swept over him the moment he stepped into the antechamber of the Glockner. The temporary exhibit gallery had been shrewdly fashioned with painted flats, huge photographs, and flat screens with virtual tours of the actual castle into an eerie representation of his Hawksmoor. Frozen in the entrance, unable to take another step closer until he could absorb the shock, Robin saw a small collection of Hawksmoor's more important furniture, paintings, tapestries, and silver scattered about the surreal set. Even at a distance, he registered the regal presence of the six Venetian walnut armchairs his mother had been so fond of, the crimson and gold Queen Anne state bed, along with its magnificent gilt wood suite of furniture, the maudlin feline silver chapel communion service his father had commissioned to celebrate the birth of a son, and all the paintings. Mother, murmured Robin, moving forward, almost breaking into a run. It was hanging off to the left, over a plaster recreation of the green drawing room's Carrera marble fireplace. The really splendid Jonathan Richardson painting of his mother, Augusta, the sixth Countess of Hawksmoor. He edged around the tightly knit groups of socialites who milled about his possessions, drinking champagne and nattering about the opera gills, or the horse show in the Hamptons. She gazed down at him with a kind smile, more than a hint of her famous sense of merriment playing across her large green eyes. Mother, Robin repeated softly, his throat tightened. She was so peaceful, so content, he could almost hear her saying to him, We are all up here, all our pain and troubles long forgotten, but where are you? It's that lovely girl in red that I like, said a woman behind him, in the slightly clipped tones favored by high society goddesses who lunched at the Four Seasons and La Bernadine. Robin turned his head, taking quick note of the sleek Manhattan matron in Chanel couture and shimmering diamonds. 
He wiped away a tear that suddenly spilled from his right eye. His mother might have liked her elegant twenty-first century counterpart. Clearly a lady of sensitivity and breeding, replied the woman's male companion, radiating vast wealth in a bespoke suit of merino wool, cashmere, and silk. Elizabeth, seventh Countess of Hawksmoor. Robin felt the words enter his brain with an electric jolt that shook his entire frame. He spun around. Directly across the room from his mother's portrait was an immense, full-length painting of Elizabeth, his Elizabeth. It just wasn't possible. They had never married. He had disappeared the night of their betrothal ball. How could she be the seventh countess? Robin felt he had almost locked gazes with Elizabeth's painted eyes as he strode across the crowded hall. She was never so pale, so wan, he thought, as he neared the massive portrait. Even her wonderful tawny hair seemed to have been stripped of its burnished gold. Elizabeth's naturally waving hair had been the bane of her lady's maid. It refused to be tamed by ribbons and pins, escaping all modish quaffs to tumble haphazardly down her back. Thin and serious, Elizabeth was drowning in a very elaborate red velvet riding habit. She stood in quiet dignity, her oval face a little averted, as if she were taken aback at all the strange modern people who stared up at her. The lush backdrop of Arcadian meadows behind Elizabeth's thin frame was supposed to represent Hawksmoor's prosperous farmlands. Ha, thought Robin, if they only knew how desolate and wild Hawksmoor country really was. Elizabeth, seventh countess of Hawksmoor, he read softly to himself, from the glowing touchscreen that served as a modern version of the printed placard, was a figure in one of Hawksmoor Castle's more interesting historical tales. Formerly Lady Elizabeth Guire, she was to all accounts in a true love match with the future Earl, Richard Robin Francis, Lord Merritt. August 3, 1750, the eve of their betrothal ball, Lord Merritt vanished without a trace and despite a search that scoured the countryside, was never seen again. Lady Elizabeth Guire was quickly married, some said with unseemly haste, to his cousin Ambrose Westmacott, who eventually became the seventh Earl of Hawksmoor. Robin paused for a moment to take in a shallow breath before he could read the last sentence. Ambrose, that mutton-headed brute, he couldn't keep his thick paws off ale or the nearest chambermaid. Elizabeth died in 1764 after taking a terrible fall down the staircase in the great hall. He took several shaky steps backwards and sat down on one of his mother's parcel-gilt Brustelon chairs. Oh, God, said Lady Caroline's assistant, Beryl. I knew it would happen. Some jerk is actually sitting on one of the Venetian chairs. I'll get security. No, don't. Lady Caroline followed the line of Beryl's pointing finger. It could be a rich American who wants to write us an enormous check to repair the roof. In exchange for a shiny gold plaque that reads, Lovingly Restored by Goldstein's Mattress Kingdom, Beryl groaned. All this work. We need money for Hawksmoor, Caroline reminded her. If we don't get a lot of it, and soon, well, you know, I'll go have a word with him. Right, I'll find that neurosurgeon and convince him to buy about a million pounds of upholstery restoration for Augusta's boudoir. And talk to Mr. Goldstein, too, Caroline grinned. I bet Augusta wouldn't say boo to a new mattress after all this time. Lady Caroline wove her way through the throngs of New Yorkers. She felt vaguely uncomfortable in the black velvet cocktail dress and wished she was back home at Hawksmoor. She'd be in a really soft pair of old peg breeches and a sweater, outside, enjoying the wild beauty of the Moor country. If she wasn't forced to save Hawksmoor Castle from ruin or sail to a theme park, she'd never stray from the Moors for very long. What a truly elegant man, Caroline thought suddenly, as the Venetian chair trespasser came sharply into view. He sat back in the ornate chair with an easy grace, as if he were the lord of the manor. He was staring fixedly at the Phillips painting of Countess Elizabeth. She liked the way his heavy curtain of hair 
fell about his slender shoulders. He looked rather shell-shocked, as if he had just taken a shot of really bad news. She decided he hadn't meant to be thoughtless about the exhibit. He just needed a friendly face and a glass of that cheap champagne. Hello, Caroline said, kneeling slightly by the carved armrest. I'm Caroline de Berry. He slowly turned his handsome head, and his green eyes widened in puzzlement at the sight of her. Cora, he began hopefully, and then closed his eyes. No, you're not her. His voice was hollow. Many people think I rather resemble the Countess, Caroline supplied cheerfully. Although I'm not really related to her at all, my ancestors took over the castle long after she died. The beautiful green eyes opened again. Forgive me, I've been very rude. You must wish to protect your lovely chair. He clasped the armrests with his long hands, pushed up to his feet, and stepped away from her. Don't disappear, Caroline insisted, laying a hand on his forearm. You're English, aren't you? Yes. He studied her face intently for a moment, and then averted his eyes to glance at a Chinese vase he didn't recall from his era. I'm Robin Dashwood. It's nice to make your acquaintance, Mr. Dashwood. Caroline smiled at him. Would you like me to show you about? There are quite a few really special pieces. We've got some awfully good ghost stories, too. I'm afraid I have to be leaving, he interrupted, rubbing his right temple wearily. But I'm glad to have met you, Lady Caroline. Thank you, Mr. Dashwood. She was surprised, but not displeased when he lifted a hand to gently push an errant strand of hair out of her eyes. You are so very like her, he murmured rather cryptically, before moving away and leaving her staring after him in fascination. Robin was almost at a run. He headed for the exit, wiping at his wet eyes and roughly shaking off the clutches of a sharp-voiced blonde creature who called him a total and complete jerk. He clattered down the wide modern steps of the Glockner Gallery, finally breaking into a run when he reached street level. With a tortured cry only other vampires could hear, Robin melted into shadow and rose up with a cool night breeze. I hope you enjoyed the first two chapters of Hawksmoor, a novel of vampire and fairy. The book and the audiobook are available at all major book and audiobook retailers. You can join us on Facebook at the Hawksmoor Club. And now, stay tuned for a short interview. Anne, tell us a little about where you grew up. What things shaped you in your life? Well, I'm the perfect mid-Atlantic. I grew up in Wales on the island of Anglesey, and I grew up in Arizona out in the desert with all the swarrow cactus and the coyotes, and I grew up with horses and dogs, so it was a terrific way to grow up. When did you actually know that you wanted to become an author? Well, I think I always knew. My father was a writer. And I think I knew when I read this wonderful novel by Barbara Willard, who was a wonderful writer for children in the 1960s. And she wrote a book called The Richleys of Tantamount about a group of Victorian children that solve an exciting adventure on a remote island. It was so full of, of ghosts and mysteries and pirates and all sorts of exciting things that I had the thought that I maybe one day I could write something kind of like it. And I hope I have. What are the passions that drive you? Well, I think it's art, whether it be ballet, uh, opera, music, books, Shakespeare, theater. I think it always comes back to human experience and human drama and the story. Tell us what you really like best about the book. What I really liked best about the book, as it turned out by the time I finished writing it, was the relationship between Robin Dashwood and Caroline Dubarry, the human girl he falls in love with. 
She's such a fun character. She's not whiny or wimpy or, you know, dissolves into puddles of tears. She's a horsewoman. She fox hunts and she's done three day eventing. And she's just a good sport and she's got a great sense of humor. And they work really well together. And I just thought it was a terrific part of the book. How did you develop an interest in vampires and, and all the creatures of the night? Well, I'm a profound paranormalist. I grew up around a mother who was fascinated with the eerie and things that go bump in the nights. I kind of grew up immersed in it, so I, I, I don't see how I couldn't have been interested in vampires and creatures of the night. When I came to write this story, I had actually had a friend who was writing a vampire novel at the time, and I thought to myself, oh, I bet I could do one, and it's time I should write something like that. So I did. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pen Dust Radio. For more information or to submit your writing to the podcast, please visit pendustradio.com. This podcast is a production of Rivercliff Books and Media. Learn more at rivercliffbooks.com. The story featured in this episode is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are the products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events, locales, or persons, living or dead, is entirely coincidental. 